Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, especially Emil and Tom. As Eliza Doolittle says, how kind of you to let me come. And you also sort of gave me tongue in cheek sort of the subtitle World Revolution and Lenin. Of course, that's in a way a very easy topic. The main thing about World Revolution was it didn't happen. Uh, it, but it did have some important sort of consequences, not just like Mr. Keynes. The consequences of this idea of world revolution and the sort of few sporadic attempts, you know, Hungary, Bavaria, a little bit of Saxony to implement it, were mainly on the domestic politics of interwar Europe, to some extent even post-war Europe. What Lenin effectively did is he consolidated the right, who were all afraid of communism, and all these people who've been fighting culture wars, culture camps and so on, were now happily working together against the Marxists. And he split the left. Austria is one of the few cases on the map where that didn't happen. Most of Europe, you have a big fight between the second and the third international, which gives a great opportunity for the right until they all botch it during World War II. But that is sort of the main impact of world revolution. The other thing about world revolution is, because Lenin believed that, if according to the Marxist calendar, he was able to grab power in a fairly underdeveloped part of the world, that could only be a sort of mistake. And that would mean that world revolution in the really industrialized countries like Britain and Germany is close behind. And that obviously leads him to the conclusion that whatever he signs away in 1918 at the Peace of Crespitos doesn't matter. Because the whole settlement is going to be overtaken by world revolution, uh, as Wilson said, you know, within the year or so. Hmm? So that makes it so easy for him to conclude this separate piece. And that, of course, brings us to the main topic, I think, and the main title, Exit Russia. Because that is the main result of World War I. I mean, very much we continue to see, and I mean, people I know are very much also responsible for that. Uh, we continue to see the world through German lenses. And the Germans have this sort of self-pity. We lost World War I. No, you didn't. You won World War I. You lost it in the end by a narrow margin in the military sense. But politically, Germany won. Strategically, Germany won World War I because Russia dropped out. I mean, A.J.P. Taylor put it so nicely. All of Europe was overshadowed. Nice phrase, can't be easily translated by Germany. Only the Germans saw the more distant Russian shadow. All right. And the Germans, when they're afraid in 1914, I've pointed it out with all the military planning, is the Franco-Russian combination. And they fear that within a few years, they will no longer be able to stand such a combination. After 1919, that is gone. On the eastern part of frontier of Germany, you now have Poland. You can almost play off Poland against Russia one way or the other. There's no longer any big danger of being crushed between two pincers of movement. That gives the Germans almost strategic immunity. And of course, Hitler then claims it's his own genius that sort of did that situation. No, it's an immediate outcome of World War I. And Harry Kramach, who is sort of one of the founding fathers of my sort of adopted home state now, Czech Republic, uh, he was very clear in his mind when, and I picked it up from an English text because obviously he didn't say it in English, when he was telling the French, you're kidding yourself if you think you won the war unless you have restored the Tsar. Well, maybe not in person, but the significance of the system, you know? And you find similar quotes by Churchill from the very same period, early 1919. That is what we must do to contain Germany. Unless we do that, we will not really have won the war. You might, of course, add, unless America is willing to sort of uphold that settlement with all her power and so on, which clearly she's not willing to do. So you need Russia. And the real conundrum of, of the peace settlement and why it isn't durable and, you know, why it falls apart almost immediately is exactly there are no great powers upholding it. I mean, it's not a question whether it was just or whether there are problems arising from it. They always do. Look at the 1945 settlement you wouldn't immediately jump to the conclusion that this was just, you know? Millions of people expelled, uh, Poles and Czechs who were on the Allied side, as well as Hungarians, Romanians who were on the German side, all subject to Soviet rule. It wasn't really all that nice. But 
it was permanent for at least for about half a century, because the two world powers of the day both supported it, even though in a curiously antagonistic fashion. But they both did. The 1918 settlement is not really supported by any great power. I mean, America, as we know, opts out. Russia being defeated and isolated. Germany obviously doesn't like it. Japan couldn't care less. And Britain is sort of, yeah, half committed, semi-isolationist. I mean, Lloyd George has this sort of bouts of fervor like Greece. But in the end, what Britain says in 1922, we are not the policemen of the world. So all you've left is France. And as Belfer said in one of his pronouncements, no matter what part of the Rhineland the French grab, there remain a third class power. They haven't realized it yet, but that's the way it is. So no one's really sort of supporting that settlement. So easy to see why it falls apart. And I think the interesting part, and that needs looking at it a little bit more detail, is why the Antarctic power? And those weren't silly people. Really. I'm against all these facial attacks, you know, that you didn't know what they're doing. No, they knew what they're doing. But why they let that happen? Uh, the choice was very stark. I mean, as Thomas outlined, either you make friends with the Bolsheviks. That's one option, you know. You create a strong Bolshevik Russia, the way sort of Stalin, in a way, put it on the map during the 1940s. It has its drawbacks, but it also has its advantages. Or you restore the Tsar, meaning a friendly, strong, conservative Russia. What the Allies, call it by that name, what the Allies managed to do is neither. They don't come to any decision on that, and so the decision goes against them. And that sort of asks the question, why did they let sort of, why did they get, in, get into such a state of grief, you know, to let that happen? Now, let's think through the first option first. Make friends with the Bolsheviks. Now, the difficulty, of course, is the Bolsheviks are the ones who take Russia out of the war. So they are quite obviously not a friendly force. Uh, in the beginning, quite clearly, and you know, the SEAL train and all those stories about how Lenin gets to St. Petersburg make it obvious uh, they are seen as German agents, which to some extent they were. They are just, you know, another damn Bosch. That's it. That's what they all say. Now, Lenin then does conclude the peace of Chestnut and of course, that again means he's an enemy. But of course, once Lenin steps out of the war, with this thought at the back of his mind, there'll be world revolution coming soon. He's still sort of neutral. He's not yet an enemy of the Arabs. There'll be some sort of negotiating going on. And you have a sort of window of last opportunity for friendship with the Bolsheviks, if you want, between March and May of 1918, when they still ponder the question whether it might not be possible. And what I want to emphasize, this is far less of an ideological question than is often thought. I mean, people like, in their memoirs and speeches, like to sort of talk about their Werte and their values. We all know that. But if you look at what actually prompted the actions, you tend to come to different conclusions. You do have people like Churchill or Kaiser Wilhelm, who are very anti-communist. You have people like Wilson and Lloyd George, where some people say as left liberals they had a sort of sneaking sympathy with revolutionaries, you know, they thought the upper classes got what they deserved, and maybe. But basically their decisions are based on context. And what is interesting in this period between early summer of 1918, it's not so much the long-term consideration, that you know, in the long term we need a counterweight to Germany, whatever happens. Something that, for instance, Smuts thought about when he you know, maybe Austria-Hungary can play that part, those are. But it's short-term necessities that govern political decisions. I mean, you find the same in the part of the central powers, you know, willing to sign away everything in the long term to get some short-term benefit. And that is, March to May of 1918 is when the Germans seem to be winning the war in military terms. I mean, as late as 11th of June 1918, you have Lloyd George in the British War Cabinet talking about, well, France is going to collapse, what are we going to do about it? Hmm. And during that period, they just say, what we need is a second front, to coin sort of Stalin term from 1943. We need a second front to you know, really keep the Germans occupied, broad groups, troops off from the West, and who's going to provide such a second front? 
The Bolsheviks are certainly not going to do it because the Bolsheviks are afraid of Germany. Lenin is interested in the survival of his system, and the only great power that can threaten him in the short term is Germany. That's what the Kaiser wants. And only the German foreign officer says, don't, no, he's quite useful for us, stop it. So the only people who can do that are, well, not really the counter-revolutionaries in Russia, because there are too few of them. Now the chance arises of the Czechoslovak League, which, of course, is the great thing for the rebirth of, of Bohemia and so on, that all of a sudden, and some people compared it to the Spanish conquest of Mexico, you know, against the Aztec Empire, a tiny band of people, 50,000 people in an age when millions are fighting on the Western Front, find themselves in charge of the lifeline of an empire, the Trans-Siberian Railway. And before that, you had a few negotiations, French and British saying, you know, that way we will sort of wheedle our way into the heart of the Soviet empire. We'll promise supplies, but in order to deliver the supplies, we'll need the railway, and we'll send the Americans in because, you know, they're not here, so we can trust them. And then all of a sudden, you have the checks along the railway. And there are two things now. One is the British say, hmm, to send the Czech Legion to the Western Front, the way Masaryk had planned it, via Vladivostok, is really sort of 80 days around the world, as Jules Rand told us. But uh, Jules Rand did not have to deal with a uh, shortage in world shipping tonnage. So the British say, no, 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 no. This is take, taking far too much in shipping to transport uh, the Czechoslovaks around the world. Better to use them in Russia right now. And just when the British are coming to that sort of conclusion, fighting starts, quite unrelated, in mid-May 1918, between the Czechoslovaks and the Bolsheviks in Chelyabinsk and some other place that people would have difficulty defining on the map. And that, of course, means that as of May, June of 1918, the Entente is now committed to having a second front by supporting the Czechs and whoever is supporting them. And the strange thing, of course, is they almost succeed. 12,000 Czechs west of the Ural Mountains almost toppled the Soviet regime in July and August 1918. But of course, the result is that Lenin is no longer neutral, but he's now signing a definite treaty with Germany, which is also partly directed against the Ottomans. But <laughs> it's sort of Lenin is now definitely an enemy. And then the British have this nice idea there's this. Russian naval officer, who after the revolution, because he finds himself in the United States, signs up for the Royal Navy. And just as he's on the way to Singapore, they say, wait a moment, maybe in a different direction. Send him back to Siberia and say, take over the government, run the country for us, and well call uh, So they are committed now to counter-revolution. And then all of a sudden, the war ends. And now the question is, the short-term aim, of having a second front in the East no longer applies. We no longer need one. But the long-term aim of establishing a friendly, maybe a strong Russia, that's still there on the map. And how can you do that? And that is the thing we talked about in the break, when the French generals, I mean, the most anti-German group in Europe, you can find, implore their home government, please tell the Germans and the armistice terms, they should, stay, they should stay put in the Ukraine and the Baltic states so that we can take over directly from the Germans without the Bolsheviks intervening. That happens in the Baltic to some extent. It does not happen in the Ukraine. That is the big breathing space for the Bolshevik regime from October, November of 1918 to the spring of 1919. They reconquered the Ukraine. They almost reconquered the Baltic. They really broadened the regime. That is probably the decisive moment. But even so, even at that point in time, and that was a perspective shared by the Germans and the Entente, people in the know throughout 1918, none of them really thought that, we talked about Austria being fired, that the Bolshevik regime is fired. They all thought this must be an aberration of history. Such an anarchical system cannot survive. And both the Germans in early 18, and the Allies in late 18 think, Whatever happens, we need to be on the side of the victims. So we need to support the white generals, the white group, wherever it is, because they are the ones who are going to run the Russia of the future. And the difficulty now in early 1919 is, give them a little bit of help, but who's supposed to be doing that? And that is maybe even the domestic aspect comes into play again, because obviously the British, for whom universal 
circumscription was a novelty in 1916 anyway, they abolished it. But even the French say, you can't fight such a sort of interventionist colonial war with conscripts. That the home front will not stand for that. So who do you find to fight for you in Russia? Maybe Senegalese, I mean the colonial troops of the French, maybe the Romanians, but they then diverted to Hungary. Then this nice idea by Churchill who says, you know, the one country in Europe that looks to the Russians as liberators are the Bulgarians. Turn it all around now. Send three Bulgarian divisions to the Ukraine. There will be about enough. And they can liberate Russia sort of in return. And as an incentive, we'll give them half of the hinterland of Constantinople. Falls through. But just the idea that you need sort of people from everywhere. And the states, that's the interesting thing, of course. These French generals gathering in Yash at the end of 1918. They have a calculus where they say, hmm, 150,000 men, that's what, what we need. I mean, to conquer a world empire, that's not much, but still more than they've got. And the stakes are rising throughout the year. I mean, in 1918, the Red Army was tiny. By the end of 1919, it's a million army. So the sooner you act, the better. And they don't get their act together during the spring of 1919. And the French are a little bit more committed to intervention. But they don't get on with the white generals. They dislike the Nikin, they have no contact with Polchak. When Janai comes to, to Siberia, he treats them badly. The British love the white generals, but they don't have any troops for them. They have a little bit of money and you know, guns, but no, we can't send any troops. Churchill's talking only in terms of volunteers. Who's going to volunteer to serve in Siberia? Not that many Brits. You know? it's, it's, it's not happening. But they are still thinking in those terms that other things being equal, uh, the white Russians are bound to win. And then you come to this sort of element of, you know, the high water mark of the white Russians, like Pickett's charge in the war between the states, General Yudenich at the front of St. Petersburg. And the nice sort of anecdote to go with it is, the French papers actually write Yudenich has taken Petersburg. And later on it's discovered that the stock exchange can they put it in the papers for some sort of, of market operation. He didn't succeed in taking Petersburg. At the same time, Denikin, who's conquered Kiev, is approaching Moscow from the south. And again, by mid-October, he's defeated. It's one of those lessons that uh, Montgomery later on summed up with the cardinal rule number one in warfare. Don't march on Moscow. <laughs> that. So by October of 1919, this whole Wishful thinking, failed effort of toppling the Bolshevik regime has failed. That becomes very clear after October of 19, there's no chance any longer. And then they all sort of, you know, we don't need to go into that in detail. Each and every one of those white generals being sent off, murdered, whatever. Now, the fallback position of the French would have been, if that is so, if we can't have a strong Russia that's friendly to us, that's supportive of French aims against Germany, then we might have, we should have a barriere de l'Est. We should gather all the states between Germany and Russia into one big alliance. And again, it doesn't come to pass. I mean, the one partner you need is Poland. And they aren't really supportive of Poland. I mean, we all know about the French military mission that was sent to Poland in mid-1920 when they performed the so-called miracle on the vistula. But if you read the, you know, what they're supposed to do, they're supposed to investigate whether it's worth investing in Poland any longer. They're not supposed to help, really. You know? So there is no real effort to help Poland. And the Poles reciprocate. I mean, what the French want them to do is be friends with Czechoslovakia and all the rest of the states that are going to form the little of France. Now, the best the French can manage is keep Czechoslovakia and Poland from fighting each other openly, as they are almost bound to do in early 1920 of a hmm? So that doesn't work. And Foch, who gets known as the French marshal, uh, gets known as the great Cassandra, because he always points out the only chance that this Barriere de l'Est will ever work is if all of them work together closely. And the Poles and the Czechs are not going to do that. That's the one. The other element, which Jean first pointed out, is if you want an anti-Russian force, you need the Ottoman Empire with successes. You need Turkey. This is Lloyd George's point. 
far from sort of, you know, strengthening Turkey, is trying to take it apart. Result is that Kemal makes his peace with the Soviets. Result is that in Poland, Pilsudski, yeah, makes his peace with the Soviets. I mean, it's very advantage of peace for Poland, but even so, uh, he is no longer going to fight the Soviets. So, from the very beginning, you don't have either strong Russia that's friendly or some sort of substitute for the Russian alliance in Europe. No, you don't. All you've got is the little Alcon, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Romania, which is a perfect alliance if you want to fight Hungary, you know? Uh, as somebody said recently, I mean, it's just a joke in between, Angela Merkel really deserves the Nobel Peace Prize because Hungary and her neighbors have always been fighting each other until Merkel was going to send them her Arabs. Now they're all cooperating on the Visegrad. But yeah, in those days, they weren't yet. So the idea is, Lulang Khan serves against Hungary, but against the big dangers facing, facing each of the three parties. Romania facing Russia, Yugoslavia facing Italy, Czechoslovakia facing Germany potentially, it's no use. So they all try and find their own sort of solutions to, for a detente with their neighbors. There's this nice episode in 1934 when the Austrians for a time really wanted to sort of raise their conflict with Hitler to an international level. They send the Austrian ambassador in Prague to Venice to say, would you support us if we brought the whole thing to the League of Nations. And Benish turns around and says, my dear Marit, haven't we all got reason not to antagonize the Third Reich? That's it. Yeah? They're, they're not going, it isn't going to serve in this anti-German fashion. So France is left without any real partners in the East. And that means Germany has won, period. And the reason, again, is the only European state that's really interested in a strong Russia, no matter with complexion, is really Russia, uh, is France. All the others, I mean, this is not just the sort of that they are confused, they don't know what to do. Lloyd George, with his laissez-faire approach uh, towards revolution in Russia, towards Poland, uh, not very supportive of any of them, is, has Britain ever been interested in a strong Russia? No. I mean, Britain signed the Entente with Russia in 1907, not because they liked the Russians, but because they thought the Russians have a lot of nuisance value. Unless we appease the Russians, they might create trouble for us in, in Asia, endlessly, where Germany can't do that much. So if we have to come to make friends with one of them, let it be Russia. They, they are not interested in strong Russia. Japan, I mean, why should Japan be interested in a strong Russia? I mean, to the Americans, it's a very far away country. <laughs> yes. The Italians, yeah, they are very platonic anti-Russia. Don't raise a finger to do anything. So that's the state of the world. So the idea is you get a Russia that in the beginning, though, is still weak. I mean, we tend to see sort of Soviet Russia as, as one of my Czech friends phrased it the other day, sort of Tyrannosaurus Rex of the late 20th century. Mm -hmm. That is the post-Stalin interpretation. During the interwar years, Soviet Russia counted as a weak Russia and in international terms, I'm not talking about the Comintern and all sorts of communist, you know, goings on. The Soviet Union, as an embodiment of Russia, is a fairly harmless creature to the 1920s. If you read all the appreciation, appreciations of the British War Office and so on, they're far less worried about Soviet Russia than they were about Tsarist Russia. So for the British, it serves them well. For the Germans, it's a potential ally whenever they want one, from Rapallo to Moscow Ribbentrop. The only people who are dished are the French. And they, the question is, do they realize it right away, or does it just dawn on them later on? Thank you.